Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today, being a Monday, we are going back to the AIG well for that CT scan lady. I'm getting mixed messages from you guys about her. I've seen comments begging me to make it stop, make it stop! But then all y'all keep on clicking on her videos in large enough numbers to keep the algorithm happy. So don't you worry, there are enough videos in this series to keep me going for a couple years now. And they'll probably add more as time goes on. <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. I'm not going to cover this whole thing, but this is probably a well that I will come back to at least occasionally. At the moment, I plan on stopping at the end of the critical thinking checks part of their playlist, and it looks like that only goes up to number seven. So next Monday should be the last that you are seeing of Miss Engler for at least a little while. So, critical thinking check number six is check the interpretations. I feel like this series so far has been mostly decent advice, but the problems have been that once you apply the checks to their organization, they fail most of them. This is where I feel like we're going to just abandon any critical thinking skills that we've learned so far in the series. Let's see if I'm right. And check number six of thinking critically about any message is, check the interpretations. Yep, it is important to look at how data is being interpreted and to investigate to figure out what the correct interpretation is. If we're talking about science, it's not like abstract art where there are multiple potential interpretations with approximately equal validity. And really, it's best if we can find sources that don't try to put an interpretation on the facts. That's one of the main problems with science news reporting. The reporters are under pressure to figure out some exciting implication of the research that will generate clicks. And often, their interpretations and extrapolations from the research that they are discussing will be more than a bit exaggerated. Though not all sciences are cut and dry between interpretation and just plain brute facts. There often is some amount of interpretation going on, and often this has its basis in how many potential confounding factors there are that can't be accounted for in a study. So when studying something like the effects of caffeine on health, it's hard to control for other factors. You need to take into consideration sex, method of caffeine intake, geographical area, blood pressure, age, daily sodium and potassium intake, whether the subjects are smokers or non-smokers, activity level, diabetes, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Things like this are especially difficult in long-term studies. There might be a behavior that coffee drinkers are just more likely to engage in for some reason than non-coffee drinkers that the researchers haven't accounted for. And stuff like this is why you get people complaining that one year eggs are healthy and the next they are not. It's not that they are changing in their health value, it's that as we collect more data, it becomes easier to weed out the confounding factors and arrive at a better conclusion. But of course, AIG isn't concerned with nutritional science, they're concerned with stuff like geology. And while there is some interpretation that goes on in geology, I have found that AIG is usually not terribly interested in the areas that require interpretation, instead focusing on calling things that are calculations based on direct measures measurements interpretations as a way of dismissing them. See, when I was a student, my classes presented all sorts of information as facts that supposedly supported evolutionary origins. Alas, my caffeine sidebar is rendered pointless by AIG's laser-tight focus on evolution. Such is my life. And lots of the information did involve scientific facts, including descriptions of fossils like this one. So you accept descriptions of fossils as fact then? You do realize that part of the description of a fossil is its age, right? But other information involved interpretations of those facts, like the alleged ages of the fossils. Nope. The age is part of the description, and it is usually based on a calculation that is performed on directly measurable data. Now, sure, most fossils are in sedimentary rock, which is difficult to directly radiometrically date, so yes, the relative dates for some of the rock layers are based somewhat on interpretation, but there's only so much wiggle room in the interpretation. If you find a fossil in a sedimentary layer that is sandwiched between two lava flows, and you date one lava flow to 10 million years, and the other lava flow to 25 million years, these dates constrain the possible age of that fossil to a range of, at most, 15 million years. Now, there is a lot more to it than that, and there are many factors that would allow us to narrow down that range much more specifically than that, but that's the general idea here. And those interpretations are based on assumptions. There are some assumptions in radiometric dating, yes. 
However, these assumptions are a lot less problematic than AIG makes them out to be. For one, most samples are dated with multiple methods. The processes that could bring about conflicting dates for the same sample using different methods are so astronomically unlikely as to be essentially impossible. And on top of all that, one of the methods frequently employed, isochron dating, directly tests for a lot of the things that AIG considers to be assumptions. So something like contamination. If there is contamination for one of the isotopes being used to date the material, it will show up on the isochron diagram. And let's also keep in mind the forgotten middle child of the science of dating samples, electron spin resonance dating. This is where we can, to oversimplify it a bunch, measure the accumulated dose of radiation a sample has received since the last time it saw the sun. Being exposed to sunlight would essentially reset this particular clock. With this method of dating, it is possible to directly date sedimentary layers. Unfortunately, it only works up to about a million years, so most sedimentary layers can't be dated that way, but it still gets us to ages that are a few orders of magnitude older than they should be, according to creationists. Yet they were often presented as though they were concrete facts themselves. Because of the extremely reliable methods that scientists use to date fossils, yes, oftentimes the age of a fossil is a concrete fact to within a certain margin of error. Now, the important thing to remember when thinking about facts versus interpretation is that everybody observes the same world. Yes, but some of us don't put on our this old book written before the scientific method was a thing must be absolutely 100% correct on everything it says glasses before looking at the world. Those glasses, unsurprisingly, tend to warp your view of reality. The same rocks, same trees, and same fossils. Same radiometric decay rates, same amounts of various isotopes found in igneous rock layers, same accumulation of radiation in sedimentary layers under a million years old, same Andromeda galaxy in the sky that is so far away that its light had to be in transit for 2.25 million years in order for us to see it. Some of us just interpret this 2.25 million year travel time for the light from Andromeda to mean that the universe has to be at least 2.25 million years old, or else we wouldn't be able to see the light from Andromeda as it wouldn't have had time to reach us yet, and that the isotopes which can be directly measured decayed at the directly measured decay rates and often are confirmed to have not been contaminated by measuring stable isotopes of the same element of the radiogenic daughter isotope. Others, without any evidence supporting their position, suggest that some entities whose existence can't be demonstrated in any way either made the light already in transit toward the Earth, giving the universe the deceptive appearance of age, or messed with the speed of light, also giving the universe the deceptive appearance of age, and messed with the nuclear decay rates in different proportions in different rocks in just the right way to make all the measurements agree with each other when they are used as dating methods. One of these interpretations is a reasonable inference based on our available data. The other is wild speculation. So we all have access to the same facts. Yes, some of us just choose to ignore a good chunk of them. But we interpret those facts differently by looking at them through different worldview lenses. Man's word or God's word. Well, here's the thing. Before you can just hold up a book and say that it's God's word, you must first provide evidence to support that claim. Sure, someone who is raised in the church and has spent their whole lives believing it and haven't really questioned it will agree with you, but put yourself in a non-believer's shoes for just a moment. I'm not even saying atheist, just pretend that you're one of the 5.1 billion people in the world who are not Christian. If you just hold up your book and say that it's God's word and you have to start with that assumption to get to your conclusions, can you see how that wouldn't be convincing to people that don't already share that assumption? Now, if it really is God's word, and it really is perfect, then you wouldn't need to start with the assumption that it was God's word. You could just suggest that we remove all supernatural claims from the presupposition category from everyone. Remember, I'm not just talking about atheists specifically here, just anyone who's not a Christian. So remove supernatural presuppositions. Then examine the evidence without starting with your assumption that your book is correct. If your book actually is correct, would such an activity not lead us to the answer that your book is correct? Why do we need to start with that as an assumption rather than arriving at that as a conclusion? Well, let me tell you, as a non-Christian, that makes it look like it obviously is not God's word if it needs humans to protect it from scrutiny. So someone looking at this fossil through the glasses of God's word might say, wow, that's great evidence for something happening quickly in a global flood. One individual fossil, maybe, but the fossil record as a whole? There are entire ecosystems buried on top of one another with zero contamination between ecosystems. 
Limestone makes up approximately 10% of the sedimentary rock on the Earth's surface, and most limestone is the direct result of biologic activity. Certainly inorganic limestones do exist, but organic limestones are much more common. It is physically impossible for all of the organisms that would be needed to produce the amount of organic limestone that we see to have existed simultaneously. Like, you see those chalk beds that are scattered all throughout the world? Those are almost literally the skeletons of dead coccolithophores. That many coccolithophores existing simultaneously would, quite literally, block out the sun from any ocean-dwelling organism unfortunate enough to live below them. And there are plenty of other photosynthesizing organisms that wouldn't have been able to survive under that mass of coccolithophores. Oh, and did I mention the radiolarians? They are protozoa, which make intricate calcium skeletons for themselves, which blanket the floor of the Pacific Ocean. This skeleton blanket is about 1.4 km kilometers thick. They don't precipitate fast enough for this accumulation to have happened since the flood. And what's more, there are fossilized radiolarians found in every layer going back to the Cambrian. But they are always separated into distinct species existing in distinct time periods. These are delicate little sea creatures, only about a tenth of a millimeter in diameter. And you're telling me that a tumultuous flood sorted them all out perfectly by species rather than mixing them all up together? But yeah, it's all about interpretation, sure. But someone looking at this same fossil through secular glasses might say, wow, that's great evidence for something happening slowly over millions of years. No, you see, any one fossil is not, in and of itself, evidence for something happening slowly over millions of years, especially something like what you are holding where I have no access to any information on the dating of that fossil. Perhaps someone with a better eye than me can figure out what species of fish it is from the video and thereby be able to loosely put a time range on it, but I can't really say anything conclusive about that fossil. It's the bigger picture of the fossil record as a whole that really kills the flood idea. And that's the interpretation which will be presented as fact in secular classrooms and cultures. Okay, so remember last time when I pointed out that AIG uses a lot of loaded language that is designed to elicit an emotional reaction rather than a logical and rational reaction, but a lot of this language doesn't appear loaded to non-Christians and sometimes wouldn't even appear loaded to non-creationist Christians? Secular is another one of those words. All secular means is that it's not based on something spiritual or religious. The science that creationists agree with is still secular science, but the word secular doesn't get invoked until we come to a disagreement. The species of the fossil? That's science. The age of the fossil? That's secular science. It's subtle, but it's definitely there. And considering the bread and butter of AIG is selling fear to parents who want to raise their kids to share their religious beliefs, which include the denial of a significant amount of science, that distinction is important. This fact pushes this video toward failing the last critical thinking check. It's propaganda. It also fails the third critical thinking check. Check the source. But really, that applies to anything coming out of AIG at this point, for reasons I discussed earlier in this series. So, how do we detangle the real facts from interpretations of facts? Well, for starters, we can ignore information being presented as facts from an organization that admits in its statement of faith that they won't publish anything that goes against their preconceived notions about the age of the Earth, especially when these things run counter to the accepted body of scientific knowledge. Well, to do that, we need to think about those two different types of science, observational science and historical science. If we wanted to use proper terminology, it would be nomothetic science and historical science. But the problem is, if you use the proper terminology, you might come across non-AIG sources that discuss the distinction between the two, and then you'll find that while natural sciences like geology can potentially be sorta of divided up that way, the lines are much, much blurrier than AIG would like, and there is significant overlap between the two. Also, people might stumble across Wilhelm Windelbrand's distinction between the natural sciences, which are nomothetic, and the humanities, which are ideographic. Windelbrand seems to use the distinction as a way of separating the soft and hard sciences. If it's objective, demonstrable, and measurable, it's nomothetic. If it's subjective and could change depending on cultural context, it's ideographic. And of course, this is a massive oversimplification, but my point is just to bring to your awareness that AIG is using terminology to describe 
describe something that already has other terms to describe it, but they change the terminology in an attempt to control what information you can find when searching for it. And this isn't the only time something like this has happened. Polystrate fossils come immediately to mind, with the more proper terminology being just upright fossil trees, or T0 assemblages if you want to get more technical. Remember, observational science uses the scientific method to measure and describe and experiment on things that we can observe in the present, like the size and mass and species identification of this fossil. Also, the various nuclear decay rates, the ratios of the parent to daughter isotopes, the ratio of non-radiogenic isotopes to both radiogenic daughter isotopes and the parent isotopes, the existence of salt deposits that require the cyclical evaporation followed by resubmersion in salt water in order to form, some of which are about a kilometer thick, the fossilized mud cracks in the Tapete sandstone formation that indicate a period of significant drying right in a time period when creationists universally agree was part of the flood, charcoal deposits that exist in sedimentary layers all over the world caused by the burning of forests something that is not possible during a global flood, and probably also not possible during the 40-day period of flesh-strippingly powerful rain preceding the flood, and I could go on. Direct observational science has confirmed, time and time again, that there was no worldwide flood, especially not just 4,000 years ago. Historical science, however, interprets those facts to draw conclusions about the past, like how and when and why this fish became a fossil. Yeah, those small details could be said to be interpretations depending on what you actually mean by those things, but they could also be based on direct observation. How did it become a fossil? Well, it was buried in sediment either during its death or shortly after it died. That's a pretty well-established fact that creationists and non-creationists all seem to agree on, though certainly creationists often present this fact as though it were supposed to be surprising to the non-creationist. But why? What do you even mean by why did it become a fossil? I mean, sure, when doing science communication, sometimes there will be imaginative stories about whatever fossil organisms are being discussed, but that's not the science itself. That's the science communication meant to get people interested in the science itself. And I don't think anyone thinks that these stories are based in anything concrete. See, that event happened one time in history, and we can't directly observe it happening right now in the present. We can only make educated guesses. About some features of the event, yes. About others, like the age, those can be directly measured. So when you encounter a message that seems to challenge a biblical worldview, you can figure out which parts of the message are facts and which parts are interpretations by first identifying the observational science involved. Except we established in check number four that AIG is grossly misrepresenting the not-quite division between observational or nomothetic science and historical science. The line is way fuzzier than they would like, and so this amounts to we have an a priori disagreement with some of these conclusions, so the conclusions that we disagree with get put into the category of historical so that they can be dismissed as a difference in worldview rather than actually having to address them. Ask, what are the measurements and observations and raw data here that everyone can agree on, and are those measurements accurate? In the case of radiometric dating, specifically the methods that can be used with the isochron diagram, the measurements are the amounts of the parent isotope, the radiogenic daughter isotope, and the non-radiogenic daughter isotope, and we can test to see whether these measurements are accurate, because when plotting them on a graph, the graph will only be linear if they are accurate. I cover isochron dating in more detail in my Evidence for Evolution dating methods video. It's a bit tricky to explain quickly, so go give that video a watch for a bit more information on how that works, but suffice it to say for now, Isochron dating directly tests for contamination in the samples and controls for it. Those accurate measurements and descriptions about the present are the facts in the message. And accurate measurements and descriptions about the present are how we measure and calculate certain features of a sample, such as age. Next, you want to identify the historical science. Ask, what are the assumptions or speculations or educated guesses that are filling in for the gaps in the facts right now? Okay, let's apply this to creationism. Assuming that they are right and the Earth is only 6,000 years old and a worldwide flood wiped out most life on the planet just 4,000 years ago, what are the guesses and assumptions that are filling in for the facts? 
Well, it is a fact that there were several cultures on multiple continents that existed both before the Flood and after the Flood, seemingly with no disturbance of continuity. It is a fact that radiometric decay rates don't seem to change. It is a fact that, in order to arrive at the numbers that the secular scientists arrive at, the decay rates would have to be messed up in the most convoluted way possible. In one rock, the uranium decay rate would have to change in a different amount than the rubidium decay rate in order to make those two measurements match up. But wait, there's more. Because both of these decay rate changes would have to be specific to that rock. A rock that we measure at a different age would have to have had the decay rates change in another different amount than in the first sample, and again different from each other. So not only do the dozens of decay rates that we use to date things all have to change in different proportions, but they would have to change in different proportions in different samples independently. Every individual sample would have to have a different decay rate. There is no known mechanism that could possibly account for this, and since every time we check decay rates they turn out to be constants, we have no reason to believe that anything even remotely close to this has ever happened. And one way to do this is to beware of red flag words like could, might, maybe, probably, possibly, and may. Yes, words like that are good to look out for before a layperson such as myself declares the results of some study to be conclusive. But I would also look out for a lack of those words. Certainty on a subject where certainty is not warranted is a huge red flag. Words like those words indicate a willingness to change one's position if the position can be demonstrated to be wrong. Certainty where it is not warranted indicates an unwillingness to change one's position no matter what. You see those words in many evolutionary contexts, and they signal that you're dealing with historical science, a possible explanation and not a definite fact. They are also often signs that you have reached the implications section of a paper or news article, where the researchers are suggesting areas for future research to solidify our certainty of the results, or where reporters are potentially exaggerating results for the sake of clicks. In textbooks when you see that sort of language, it's usually with reference to matters that aren't entirely settled. But I doubt you'll find language like that surrounding things like the age of the Earth. It's not that the Earth MAY be older than 6,000 years old, it is older than 6,000 years. That's a fact. Something else that's important to remember is that there's probably a lot more to the story than what you're hearing. Especially if you're hearing it from a creationist. A huge part of my job on this channel is tracking down quotes that creationists use from papers or news articles, and when they're not citing other creationists, they are almost always removing the quotes from their proper context, often completely reversing the meaning of the quote in the process. Likely, what you're hearing is the most polished presentation of the secular side of the story. Again, that word secular. It's not a secular side of the story. Looking at the data from a secular perspective would, if the Earth really were only 6,000 years old, lead you to the conclusion that the Earth is only 6,000 years old. It just wouldn't assume that it is because of a god. So the next step is to look for alternative explanations. Ask, what's another way of looking at this, and how would someone interpret this same fact through a biblical lens? You shouldn't need a biblical lens to arrive at the conclusion that the Bible is true if the Bible actually were true. The secular lens would get you there just fine if it were actually true. We're not just talking alternate interpretations of agreed upon facts here. We're talking about creationists ignoring facts, calling facts that aren't up for debate into question, and sometimes just outright making up their own facts. These tactics would not be necessary if creationism were actually true. You can go to solid apologetics websites like Answers in Genesis to find out, or you can ask a biblical creationist mentor, or research what other scientists have said about the same topics. One out of three of those suggestions is likely to get you to the correct answer. Alright, so let's say that you saw this fossil in a museum where a guide is explaining, well this 300 million year old fossil likely formed because when this fish died it sank to a lake bottom where sediment slowly covered its body and permineralized the bones over a long period of time. Did you notice that the likely in that sentence didn't come until after the age? That indicates that the age is a sure thing, but we're not sure of the exact details of what the fish might have been up to when it died. Though what kind of sediment it was buried in is a pretty good indicator of, you know, how it was buried. How would you separate the facts there from interpretation? 
Well, using the methods you went over in this very video, the interpretation comes in with regards to how it was buried. You said it likely sank to the bottom and was buried. Sure, it's possible that it didn't sink, maybe it was washed ashore and that's where it got buried, but sinking to the bottom is more likely, hence it likely sank. The rest seems pretty solid. Well, the fact from observational science is that this is a fish fossil. So you don't even agree that it was buried? Okay then. The interpretation is that it formed slowly over 300 million years ago, and an alternative explanation from a biblical perspective is that it formed quickly during the flood described in Genesis. Okay, so how about you explain how that fish could have survived in an environment where the entire surface of the Earth would have been covered by about 18 meters of marine animals? That's assuming that 1% of the sedimentary rock around the world represents fossilized marine animals, a very conservative assumption given the fact that some layers of limestone are 100% fossil. And that's just marine animals, it's not even counting plants or terrestrial animals. Forget about space for all the animals on the ark, there's no space for all the animals on the planet that would have had to have existed simultaneously in order for all these fossils to be deposited in Noah's flood. That fish didn't stand a chance. That's it for this one. Turns out I was right. This is where the actual critical thinking skills were left behind in favor of, I don't agree with the conclusion, so let's call it historical science and dismiss it. Today's comment of the day comes to us from DJ Ixy, DJixy, DJixy, Dishy? I don't know whatever that name is, 98, who says, Finally, I can be one of those people who say, I was with you since 100 subs, lol, but seriously, poetry is my jam and I write it in my spare time, so I will definitely check it out. So this is with regards to me posting that my wife is starting a YouTube channel. It's relaxation focused, maybe even slightly ASMR-ish. She makes time lapses of our 3D printer printing various things, and then she wrangled me into using my NPR voice to read poetry over the top of the time lapses. It has nothing to do with atheism, science, or religion, and if it's not your cup of tea, I understand. But if you think that you might be interested, go check it out. I'll leave a link in the description. Oh, also, just a note, we already got a bunch of comments saying that the videos are too short. The long-term goal is to have a playlist of everything potentially adding up to several hours in the end, but it can take several days just to make one time lapse that lasts for less than 15 seconds. It's a long process, so don't expect an hour-long video of me reading the Epic of Gilgamesh filled with time lapses quite yet. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the observational science to the historical science that is my channel. If you'd like to be an arbitrary and fuzzy distinction that serves no purpose but to make creationists feel warm and fuzzy, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wish list, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>